I want to talk with you about sustainable water. First, the technical challenges of water and the definition of water sustainability. The issue of water supply, uh, the quantity of water, distribution of water, efficiency, the technology of water itself, and the whole issue of water efficiency, because we waste enormous amounts of, wa of fresh water on this planet. Uh, the issue of water quality, uh, pollution, organizational management challenges, financial challenges, the public policy issues, and then I'll wrap it up. Definition. Water is a finite resource on our planet, but it's a renewable resource. There's only so much water, but in effect, uh, it does, when you use it, it doesn't disappear. It doesn't leave the planet. It either evaporates into the atmosphere and returns in the form of rain, or it combines with other chemicals on the ground and makes it unfit for uh, consumption as fresh water. Most of the water on the planet is actually in the form of salt water. And in fact, most of the planet is covered by salt water. Um, so if we could figure out some way of using that water, and we have actually figured out the technology, it's called desalinization, uh, that would ease elements of the water crisis. But if you think that water from the Catskills is expensive, water from the Atlantic would be more expensive. So the focus tonight is maintaining the quality and quantity of water needed for human life and the support of key ecosystems and food systems that rely on water. In other words, we require water as a biological species known as human beings, but so do the plants and animals that make up the rest of, of our ecosystem. The entire system requires water. Um, it's really a biological necessity. Now here at Columbia, uh, the head of our water center is an engineer, uh, an Earth Institute faculty member named Manu Lau. And he and his colleagues have divided the water issue into three components. I think it's useful to think about water the way that Manu thinks about it. First is the issue of access to water. So there, could, there can be you know, sort of water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. There's plenty of water, but you need infrastructure to store it to treat it and to deliver it, to bring it to people's homes and to their farms. Then there's the problem of damaged or polluted water. The water, uh, we may have those systems, uh, but the water that it's dealing with is so dirty that it has to be filtered and filtered and filtered. And then there's the issue of water scarcity resulting from imbalances of supply and demand in some geographic settings. People have moved to places where there isn't any water. Uh, we call that Las Vegas. Um, on a pure environmental basis, you would never have a city of that size in the middle of the desert. Uh, it's a little bit crazy. Um, nevertheless, uh, the technology exists to carry the water and filter it. And uh, for some reason, uh, a million some odd people have decided to move to this place. Um, but the original places people settled uh, for coming from Europe uh, in the United States was in the places that had these natural resources, particularly water. Um, so this definition is a really succinct uh, analysis of the component parts of the challenges to fresh water sustainability. Access, pollution, and misdistribution of people and water supplies. Um, and the other thing, and this is one of the issues related to climate change, which is why these issues are interdependent, where today's fresh water is may not be where it is 50 years from now if the planet gets three, four, five degrees warmer. So these things uh, could be changing. So let's talk about uh, the issue of water supply, quantity, distribution, and efficiency. First, is there enough water? Now, the first thing to think about is at least 70%, if not a little bit more, of all the fresh water in the world goes to farming. About 20% is used by industry, and only 10% gets to the households. And this is, if you go to a place like California, most of the water that comes from the Colorado goes to the farms, not to the cities. And in fact, an emerging discussion is just that very issue. There is disagreement among experts about the absolute shortage of water worldwide. 
Uh, the United Nations projects that two-thirds of the world's population will experience water stress by 2025. But it's not that there is not enough water on the planet for everybody to have enough. It's that the water isn't where the people are, and some of the water is increasingly polluted. And so, but, but unlike some of the other absolute scarcity issues we may face in coming generations, water is a renewable resource. So it's finite, but its recharge is part of the natural order of the ecosystem. Rapidly growing cities in the developing world are the places where we're going to see the most water scarcity. Uh, about three years ago, the UN reported that more than half of the planet now lives in cities. And in many of these emerging cities, uh, the issue of water is, is, uh, is a real problem. There is not enough capital for the infrastructure. So the kinds of investments we've made here in New York simply can't be made in other parts of the world because they don't have the capital for the infrastructure and the water is not plentiful nearby. So a, a project like the Colorado River Project, which is uh, how the western part of the United States distributes most of its water, uh, much of its water, uh, would simply be impossible in other parts of the world. Generating the capital for water infrastructure is a worldwide challenge. Systems to treat and dis distribute water uh, and collect and treat sewage are essential to public health and welfare. So these packets we talked about uh, that Procter & Gamble has that, that we distribute uh, in the case study that we read, again, a short-term solution. The long-term solution is we have to have enough capital uh, to do this. Now, over the past several decades, residents and businesses in New York City have directly paid the cost of rapidly rising water infrastructure. The water bills that people pay in New York City are growing dramatically on an annual basis as the system's requirements become more expensive and more capital, uh, more and more capital uh, is needed to run the, the water system. And, you know, it's an interesting kind of question. You know, people in this country don't want to pay more taxes, uh, and they don't like the fact that their water bills are growing, but they see the connection between the service uh, and, and the fee, and so it may be, in the long run, a more successful strategy than, than a general tax. I mean, people pay for things today that they didn't pay for uh, 50 years ago. Water, uh, you pay for your television. Uh, you know, when you had three channels and rabbit ears, it didn't cost you any money. Uh, now it costs you a lot of money. People's cable bills are upwards of $100 a month uh, in many cases. And uh, in the case of water bills, uh, they're growing at a rapid rate as well. So let's talk about the technology of water. Because in the end, this is a problem that is amenable to a technological fix. With enough capital and energy, the, the world's supply of fresh water uh, could be expanded dramatically. Each year, more and more of our water is filtered before we use it, and more and more sewage is treated as well. In a sense, these are two parts of the same equation. If you have untreated sewage going into drinking water, then the filtration process is that much more uh, expensive and extensive. If, on the other hand, you're treating the sewage first, you uh, your filtration problem uh, is less uh, difficult. But the capital requirements run into the billions, and many millions of dollars are needed in operation and maintenance. So it's not enough to build the filtration plant. You have to operate it. That takes people and fuel and it takes uh, uh, t new technology and training to keep the system in good repair. These are not simple uh, technologies, they're, and increasingly they're more compli com complicated uh, because of the use of, of computers and of, and of higher level filtration than we used to use. Now, arid regions of the world have benefited from the development of massive waterworks projects. And, and like I said before, Phoenix, Las Vegas, Los Angeles simply wouldn't have been possible without water technology. These are cities that are wholly dependent on that, but so is New York. You could never have had a city of this size without the subway system and without the water system. You simply couldn't uh, have, it couldn't have happened. And so the technologies led to this kind of development. 
Now, interestingly, the filtration of water for reuse, which you're now seeing where we're taking sewage, sewage treated water, retreating it and using it, for example, to water uh, and to irrigate uh, golf courses and things like that. Uh, you can use wastewater almost directly on, for that kind of use. You don't want to put it on crops, but you know, a few golfers, you know, it's a different story. Uh, no, seriously, it's, uh, you are able to use different quality water uh, for different uses. The real interesting technology is desalinization. And the big problem with desalinization is the cost of energy. If you reduce the cost of energy dramatically, the cost of desalinization would go down dramatically. Now, what we don't know is then what would be the impact on the oceans? Because if you're taking a lot of water out of the oceans for fresh water, what's left will actually become different in its chemical composition than it is today. So there's a question of how much of that you could actually do if it became massive. But uh, the other potential with cheap energy would be ever more elaborate filt filtration processes so that you literally separate the H2O uh, physically from all the contaminants that attach to it through the use of technology. So that's one solution. The other is greater efficiency. One way to sustain the level of water we need is to increase water productivity. And we're seeing a lot of work being done on this in a whole variety of ways. One place is in the household with things like you know, low flow toilets and showers and things of that sort. The other uh, is in agriculture itself. Uh, open irrigation ditches lose water to evaporation. That's one possibility. The other is the actual plants. You could actually breed plants genetically to be more efficient in their root structure to use water more efficiently and effectively. And so that's part of what you can do. Um, in a lot of ways, a lot of the waste we have has to do with government subsidies. We've actually encouraged the wasteful use of water, particularly for agriculture, through the way we've subsidized uh, different kinds of uses and subsidized irrigation uh, here, uh, particularly in the United States. Um, government also often provides incentives to farmers to only grow a few specific crops, which will then discourage them from choosing crops based on local conditions, uh, including water availability. So that's another uh, one of the problems. The entire system of what's grown where needs to be rethought with the idea of water efficiency in mind. Crops could be grown where there's sufficient rain for their water needs. I mean, sometimes you'll see that in a local economy that it, some of the crops need a lot of water. They will grow them because they can get the irrigation, but they would be better off growing something else in that place based on the local conditions. But if the water comes to them cheap through a government subsidized irrigation system, then there's no incentive for them to, to match the plant uh, to the local ecosystem, particularly when some plants and some foods are subsidized by the government and some are not. And, uh, and I mentioned that household use of water uh, can be uh, reduced through some fairly simple technologies. Um, we had a group of students in the Environmental Science and Policy Program that looked at um, water use, uh, I think it was in Abu Dhabi last year, and it turns out the wealthy folks in that desert country, uh, the highest status symbol is to have a fountain in your, in your uh, yard, in your courtyard. And so all the wealthy people have these very elaborate waterworks that lose enormous amounts of water. In fact, the per capita use of water in this country is something like 20 or 10 or 20 times what we use here in the United States, and we're not that efficient here. So it's pretty amazing. Uh, and so there are clearly some areas where you could get uh, water efficiency. And as I said before, different uses of water can tolerate different levels of water quality. You don't need everything to be pure. Uh, the water quality, for example, in the Hudson is not the kind where you want to just scoop it out and drink it. On the other hand, you could ride a bicycle very close to it and it's not going to poison you the way it would have when we used to dump raw sewage directly into the Hudson River which we haven't done since the mid-1980s. Until the mid-1980s, we did that. We dumped raw sewage right into the Hudson. Uh, it was delightful on the summer, a nice warm summer evening, walking along Riverside Drive, you know? I mean, I, I often say there's a reason why Riverside Drive is a quarter mile from the river, uh, you know? And it's the, it was the raw sewage. 
Now, we heard this before when people were talking about their case, but nearly a billion people do not have access to drinkable water, and over two and a half billion people don't have access to improved sanitation. This is a large portion of the planet. And infectious diseases can result from water polluted by human and animal waste. Uh, and cancer, of course, can result in other diseases from the toxic chemicals. And we're seeing more and more of this in the developing world as industrial practices are taking place uh, that are where the factories are paying no attention whatsoever to the effluent coming out of, of the factory pipelines. Um, and in rural areas, we also have water being polluted by runoff from farms that have been treated by herbicides, pesticides, and, and fertilizer, all of which you can control. You can create different technologies. You can be more careful in how you uh, apply these uh, technologies to the farm. Uh, it's not something that has to be done the way that we're doing now. Um, I think it's really important to understand that. Uh, these are uh, important technologies. I mean, the fact is when we talk about food next week, if it wasn't for industrial farming, we would all be starving to death. And so we need those technologies, but we need to make them more sustainable. Now, the ocean is also increasingly a place, uh, a, a large garbage pail. Uh, the, what's called marine debris uh, is growing. If you, ha if you have a, a home, as I do in, in Long Beach, New York, uh, every morning in the summer, they have to go and rake the beach and, and clean up all the stuff that floats in. Uh, it's just a routine. They don't even think about it anymore. You got uh, guys with these beach rakes, and then you have kids with green garbage bags and little poles they pick up the garbage with uh, all summer long. And it happens all over, uh, all over the United States, and here's a nice picture of it. Um, we've seen loss of biodiversity from overfishing. And also the practice of inadvertently in introducing invasive species uh, in, because what happens is you take water in a ship, say in one part of the world, and then you dump the water out in another part of the world. And so the ecosystems of this other part of the world are exposed to whatever was living in that water. And uh, in the Great Lakes, we have all sorts of problems with uh, some very fast growing clams and other uh, life that attaches to peers and so forth. So this issue of water quality uh, is important and is a growing issue worldwide. And, and again, a problem that can be solved with better technology and better management practices, which leads me to the issue of organizational and management challenges. Now, the past several decades have, have brought substantial improvement uh, in the technologies of water supply and sewage treatment. When we built the first sewage treatment plants in New York City, we had what are called, what's called primary treatment, which was essentially a screen that kept the junk from going into the Jamaica Bay. Then we created secondary treatment where we evaporated some of the contaminants uh, and then created a sludge. And now we have what's called tertiary treatment where we apply technology to actually change the chemical composition of the waste. In fact, in New York City, we do something pretty interesting here. Some of the older treatment plants in Brooklyn take their sludge and bring it to the treatment plant here up in Harlem because this is a tertiary plant and the plants that they come from don't treat it enough to actually be legal under EPA's regulations for what kind of uh, effluent to uh, emit into the waterways. Uh, so that's just an indication of how this technology has improved. But it's not just the technology. Somebody has to know how to run this stuff. People have to, have to use the technology and maintain it. And so the use of standard operating procedures and, tra and, and training to make sure that these sewage treatment plants are being run correctly is absolutely uh, essential. The more complex the technology, the more you need to have people better trained to run these plants and to understand what's going on inside of them. So as the technology gets more complicated, the management issues associated with running the technology gets more complicated. Preventive maintenance becomes more and more important. It's very undervalued in many organizations, which don't do the little things to keep the, the plant from collapsing. And so it's important to have not just people that know how to work the stuff, 
but it's like, a, it's like your car, you know, every 10,000, 15,000 miles, it's got to be brought in to have routine maintenance done to it. And we're much better at this than we used to be, but people are impatient with putting the resources into it. The politicians get to cut a ribbon when there's a new plant, but they're not that interested in funding the routine operation and maintenance because it's not that glamorous. It's not that interesting. You know, it, it certainly doesn't get you a picture in the local newspaper when, uh, when you're opening the facility. In the developing world and here in the United States, we're seeing the growth of private contractors to run these plants, which is largely a good thing because the private sector has the profit motive to develop technology and because of the, their performance will be monitored if they want to win the next contract, it's a useful technique. But there has to be somebody in the government who knows enough about the technology to actually manage it. Uh, my friend Brent Millward at the uh, University of Arizona has written about this management issue. He calls it the hollow state, where you basically have, set, have taken all the technical expertise out of the government because you've contracted out everything, and what remains, there's nobody there who knows enough about the technology to manage it. And so what they need, of course, are people from the masters of uh, programs here at Columbia to go out uh, and help run it, because you'll have enough of the science and you'll have enough of the management that you can combine those skills and, and help run uh, these contracts for uh, the government. So there's management and organizational challenges associated with water. Uh, and then there are, of course, fin finance challenges. Financing sustainable water and sewage systems is a challenge for New York City, which has plenty of money. How about the developing world? How are we going to fund this? How are we going to get the capital that's necessary? Now, what's interesting about it is because you have to have clean water, it's a necessity of life. It's a primary function that government has to perform. Um, it's very important to have a financing scheme. In New York, uh, we created uh, the Water Finance Authority and Water Board, which uh, has essentially taken the management of water into a uh, an, into an authority framework that generates its own revenues. Uh, when the water board wants to raise your water bills, they don't have to go to the legislature to get permission. And it's a good thing, because otherwise we probably would be drinking poisoned water. So, nevertheless, uh, it's a finance challenge. There has to be enough money available to, to make this happen. Now, the household water bill has become an established fact of life in the United States. Now, it sometimes is hidden in your property tax. You may not pay a water bill in some localities. You, it just goes into your property tax. But in New York City, we have a separate water tax, separate property tax. Um, and in other parts of the country, you see it funded in different ways. But it's becoming more and more an identifiable cost of doing business. And water bills are growing. In 1985, the water rate in New York City was $1 per 100 cubic feet. By 2010, it was nearly $7. So that means that in a quarter century, the water bill has gone up by 700%. Uh, that's a little bit more than inflation. The price of water is growing as additional technology and energy is used to purify it and to transport it. We actually need to develop new processes that are more cost effective, use less energy um, to clean the water. But in fact, if anything, we're going to need to put more energy into it because the pollutant levels are getting higher. And so we're going to have to spend more and more of our time doing this. And as the planet gets more crowded, the infrastructure of water transport has to be placed in more densely settled places, and that can be expensive. Putting a water pipe into a rural area is cheaper than putting a water pipe into New York City. And that well that, that you were talking about in Connecticut, that's not going to be as good a solution as the groundwater uh, becomes contaminated by a hever, heavier and heavier development in suburban areas. In fact, many people have found that well that you used 25 years ago can't get you the water you need today. And in fact, people are, are uh, getting their water from uh, municipal systems more and more. Uh, although 50% of the uh, households in the United States get their water from groundwater, largely from wells right now. Um, it's becoming, that, that's a lower number than it used to be, but it's still a very high number, and it's really a reason why we have to maintain the quality of our groundwater. So it leads to this issue of public policy. 
Water supply is a critical responsibility of government, and the need for water is not controversial. In other words, there are certain services that government performs that they simply must perform. Um, you have to have water. Um, the skills of the private sector are needed for water sustainability, but so is the regulation of the water and the capital formation, which requires public resources. We also have to spend money on the basic research and development to keep improving this technology. The technology of water supply, water treatment, sewage treatment has been improving. Some of that is government spending on R&D. Some of it is the companies that build these plants uh, getting better. But we have to keep applying technology to it uh, because the problem is not going to get easier to solve. It's going to get more difficult to solve. And of course, you have to face equity issues. Water is a biological necessity and can't be denied to poor people. You know, there's this Arnold Schwarzenegger movie that takes place on Mars, you know, where, they get, where the poor people, uh, you know, their oxygen supply is threatened. You know, the whole movie is about that. And, you know, water is, that's actually how we do water here now. We don't do it to air, but we do it to water. So uh, technology has to be transferred to the developing world. And we have to figure out ways of bringing water supply uh, to everybody. Because the, the whole issue of poverty eradication and sustainable development you know, is not going to be solved without investment in this infrastructure. Now, in the short run, you can use these little pellets from Procter & Gamble. But as I said, that's not the long-term solution. So let me conclude. First, water can be used more efficiently. We should focus attention on reducing the use of water in agriculture. The technology of waste treatment, water filtration, and desalinization can be used to increase our supply of water. But the issue of cost is not going away. We're going to have to figure out ways of improving both the technology, the use of capital, and the distribution of water. It's a major public policy problem, and it needs to be addressed.